introduce our speaker, Adam T. from Los Angeles, California. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Adam. I'm an addict. I'd like to uh, first thank the committee for asking me to uh, come out and speak tonight. It's, um, it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to participate in Narcotics Anonymous. Um, ultimately, it's a responsibility to give back what was so freely given to me. I want to welcome you guys that are new. If uh, you're trying NA one more time, if perhaps you don't think this will work for you, if you really don't want to be here. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I, I hated all you happy people, you know. <laughs> I, didn't, I would get released from treatment centers, and the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, get involved in this. I mean, a lot of people get loaded to fit in. I wanted to get away from everybody. You know, and um, I mean, I did that walk of shame. I had so many key tags and chips. I stood up for 17 years. I mean, I, I could have played poker with them all. It was ridiculous. And, you know, I don't mean to be funny, but I did that walk of shame over and over and over again. And, you know, I would go into your head and look back at myself and think, what a loser. Why can't you get this? What's wrong with you? And I mean, I know the old timers were judging me. You know, if you're new, we're judging, right? You know what they say, right? They say, oh, don't judge anybody in Narcotics Anonymous. You ever hear that? Five minutes later, they're telling you to stick with the winners, right? You hear a lot of stuff in recovery that's not necessarily in the basic text. They'll tell you, don't make any major decisions in your first year. Have you guys seen the third step? It comes out of treatment center. What's the other one? Oh, don't get in a relationship in your first year. No one knows if that works. No one's ever done it. You know, there's a couple, right? There's always a saint in the crowd. If you got an A-hole on, don't let it choke you. But the one I love is God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And you know, if that was true, I wouldn't need God's help. And the longer I've been separated from narcotics, the longer I've been in recovery, the more I've absolutely needed God's help. And Narcotics Anonymous has done for me what I could never do for myself. It's done for us collectively as a group conscious what none of us could do. You know, and I never wanted to admit that I needed you. And I think the most common thing that we say in recovery, the most important thing that we say in recovery is yeah, me too. You know, I never really understood that because for me, like a lot of us, this is a disease of isolation. It's about being separate, different, and alone. You know, and eventually I, I started going through treatment centers, you know, and this isn't a plug for treatment, but by the time I finally got clean, I'd gone through treatment 28 times. And I remember telling my sponsor, you know, I went through treatment 28 times. I was hoping that would get rid of the guy, you know, loser. And he looked me right in the eye and he says, you know, that doesn't make you an addict. And I thought, you're kidding. He says, no, it means you paid half a million dollars for our basic text. And I wasn't laughing. I didn't think that was funny. You know, and my experience shows me that any scheme that attempts to shield the addict from temptation is doomed to failure. See, treatment was a great place to fatten me up for another run. But treatment never solved the problem. And I always thought the problem was narcotics. And a guy said to me, you know, that little bag of dope, that little bindle, that little crack pipe, if that's your problem, he said, you're probably not an addict. And then he said to me, if you're a real addict, the type that's described in the literature, your problem isn't narcotics. And you know what? It took me another decade to understand what he was trying to tell me. Because from the time I was in junior high school, it was obvious that I couldn't live with narcotics. You know, pissing in my pants, drooling on my desk. I mean, you know, seventh grade. Everyone could see I couldn't live with narcotics. They used to call me space Kinnett. You know, everyone thought I was like, you know, Asian because I couldn't keep my eyes open. You know, I couldn't live with narcotics, but if you're an addict in recovery, the greater aspect of this disease is the fact that I can't live without narcotics. And I have a mind that always takes me back to a bag of dope. I have a mind that will argue with anybody about anything at any time. You tell me it's black, I'll tell you it's white. 
You tell me to go right, I'll go left with an attitude. Right? I'll blame you the whole way. It's your fault. That's why we say denialists don't even notice I am lying. You know, and I do it in every aspect of my life. I don't just do it with narcotics. You've been separated from, from you know, narcotics for a while. You know what happens, right? It, it manifests in all these other behaviors. Like we say, you know, I, I put down the spoon, and what do I do? I pick up the fork. Next thing you know, I'm like, they can't see my feet. And I'm on my knees in step six and seven saying, God, please remove this from me. I can't live like this anymore. Then I put down the fork and pick up the credit card. Now I'm going to fix what I did with a fork, buying clothes. I'm going to hide it. I'm in liposuction. And then I'm on my knees again in step six and seven in bankruptcy court saying, God, please, I can't live like this anymore. Then you know what I do? I start acting out in the rooms. Can't go to that meeting again. <laughs> Can't go to that meeting again. It's no wonder there's 412 step programs. They're all identical except for the first half of step one. And you come into Narcotics Anonymous and you've got alcoholics, then you've got addicts, then you've got addict alcoholics, then you've got alcoholic addicts that are somehow different, right? And then you've got the dope fiends in the back that are worse than all of us. And if we don't have a common problem, we don't have a common solution. I suffer from the disease of addiction. One program, one recovery, one message. You know, and it's my experience now that when I straighten out spiritually in the steps, I straighten out mentally and physically in all the other areas. And I never understood that. And what I would do is I would play musical poisons in the first half of step one. Like we say, it's like changing seats on the Titanic. <laughs> you know, and never really address the problem. And I always thought the problem was narcotics. You know, and it took a long time for me to really understand what this spiritual malady is. A malady that moves me into an obsession. An obsession that moves me into this allergy where I can't stop an analogy that kills me. So I can't live with it, but the greater aspect of this disease, and if you're like me, I really can't live without it. And eventually I started going through treatment centers, and you know, I was in my final treatment center. I was 120 pounds. I had tracks from my wrist to my neck. I looked like I just got out of a concentration camp, you know. I was hopeless, I was dirty, I was lost. I'd let everybody down one more time. Remember that great feeling in detox? You know, I've been on methadone maintenance for 10 years. You know, when this woman comes in on her H&I panel, you know, to do her H&I talk, you know, probably from the Liquid Fellowship, you know, one of Clancy's crew, right? Wearing a business suit. You know, and she looks down at us and she says, if I could give you all the gift of recovery, I wouldn't do it. You know what I said? I looked at my friend and I said, what a bitch. <laughs> and what she said was, she said, the reason I wouldn't give you the gift of recovery is because I wouldn't rob you of the journey. And all of these years later, I understand that that journey to recovery, very much like that journey to surrender that each and every addict has to walk is personal. And thank God we don't shoot our wounded in Narcotics Anonymous. This would be an empty room. <laughs> By the way, if you're new, I want to welcome you. We're the only people that want a reward because we ran out of a burning building. We're really happy you're here. If you're sitting here tonight thinking about getting loaded, it beats the hell out of being in a dope house right now thinking about being clean. And there's a lot of people that were sitting next to us that are out there right now thinking about this. You know, down on Fremont in the hotels. I know what it's like. You know, it's difficult sometimes to stay here, but it's almost harder to get back here. You know, and for me, like a lot of us, the door evolved for a long time, you know. And then eventually it slammed shut. 
And then I was shooting dope in county jail. I was getting loaded in treatment. You know, I was having people mail it to me. You know, and all of a sudden I couldn't get back here. You know, I was going to that clinic every single morning. Dying of this thing. And the disease killed me every day, but it wouldn't bury me. And if you're new, my sponsor said, when I got clean, he said, I want you to buy a black suit. And I said, why? And he said, well, you're going to go to a lot of funerals. And then he said, if you get loaded again, at least we'll have something nice to bury you in. He wasn't nice to me. See, but the reality is, if you baby the addict, you'll bury him. Tell me the truth. That this is a fatal, progressive, chronic disease. That this disease for me is like being on a train. And the train only goes to one place. We know where it goes. It goes to jails, institutions, and death. That's the only place the train goes. Now, right now, we're at a station. And I feel safe. But my experience shows me that I will get back on that train again. You know, it took a long time for me to really understand what it meant to be powerless. Because people say, what's your drug of choice? I'm like, what's your drug of no choice? You know, I could put this down and that down, but you put that shit in front of me, I'm shitting in my pants. You know, I can't say no. And I'm very clear on that powerlessness. And people say, oh, don't use no matter what. I'm like, why don't you join Nancy Reagan's Merry Band of Winners and just say no? When everything in my consciousness, in my life, demands that I stand and deliver, I show up loaded for weddings and funerals and baptisms. Oh, I don't show up at all. You know, I'm stuck in that hotel room. I'm stuck in that, you know, that public toilet. And I do that over and over again. And it took me a long time to really understand that concept, that I can't bring into my consciousness all of that pain and all that suffering that happened to me. It took a long time for me to really understand that that journey to surrender that we talk about, like that journey to recovery is is really, really personal. You know, and me after spinning out of control and being in the rooms and going to the clinic and, and sitting in noon meetings and drooling on myself and taking other people out with me and doing all the despicable, diabolical, disgusting things that a lot of us have to do on that road to desperation, you know, I wish I could give that to you if you're new. But see, that's the cover charge for Narcotics Anonymous. That walk of pain. I hate to say it. That's why, you know, it's only a buck. It took a long time for me to get any kind of clarity that, you know, that surrender, it's the hardest thing in the world to have, you know? Now, I do a lot of H&I. I I should, right? I'm an alumni from everywhere. And by the way, if you're new and you heard about Narcotics Anonymous in treatment, hospitals and institutions, which is one of the committees in Narcotics Anonymous, has the lowest relapse rate in all of recovery. You know, and one of the things that I started doing was taking these meetings and panels back into institutions, into prisons, into hospitals, and into detoxes. And, you know, I have a panel up at the VA, which is the Veterans Administration, and You know, it's a really strange thing because, you know, you get in a room about this size, right, full of soldiers, you know, and you pick a topic like surrender, you get dirty looks, and the room gets really quiet, especially Marines. But one of the greatest illustrations of surrender that I'd ever heard came out of one of those experiences. If you ever watch a soldier surrender, the illustration's perfect. You'll see him take the rifle, lay it down on the ground, sit down on the side of the road, wait for someone to tell him what to do. When you got 40 AK-47s pointed at your head, you don't throw down the gun with an attitude. What's your relationship to narcotics, huh? You get caught looking at the gun, you know someone's going to put a cap in you, right? Am I looking back at narcotics? Am I looking back at the magic that I once found? 
See, because if you have that reservation as an addict like I did, life has its moments. And for those very moments, I am willing to give my life to recapture and recreate the magic that I once found in the bag. That sense of freedom, that sense of peace, that sense of unity, that spiritual connection, that magic that I once found. And my experience shows me that unless I can find that freedom and that balance and that focus that I sought through narcotics, through the 12 steps, there's no way I'm going to stay here. Now, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Harry Tebow who was one of the contributing members to some of the original literature. And he talked about the difference between compliance and surrender. And I think you can look him up on the internet. And, you know, I had been in compliance to Narcotics Anonymous for years, doing it for sober living, doing it for the judicial system, doing it for the parole department, doing it for family services. Where I live on the west side, they do it for the trust fund. But see, that concept of surrender, very much like that soldier that lays down that rifle, is unconditional. And I had to look at my relationship to narcotics, that I couldn't stop once I started, that I couldn't stay stopped on my own, that I couldn't stop without a spiritual experience. And I had this mind that always takes me back. And for me, there was a huge difference between the act of surrender that got me into the program and into Narcotics Anonymous over and over and over again and the state of surrender that's keeping the old timers here. It's a completely different concept. It's kind of like watching a swan glide across a pond of still water. It looks so graceful. It's so effortless. It's so smooth. It's beautiful. But you know what's going on under the water, right? He's paddling like hell. And people ask me, what changed after going through treatment 28 times? What changed after being in the rooms for 17 years loaded? And what changed is action. That I became willing to take actions in Narcotics Anonymous that I did not believe in. I became willing to set aside everything I thought about N.A., about the 12 steps, about you, about me, and about God so I could have a new experience with this thing. And I started to look at it from a different perspective. I swear to God, if this was a room full of dope dealers, you'd have every number in here. That's why when Narcotics Anonymous started, they didn't want us meeting. Because most of us, a lot of us were felons. But we're here for the purpose of recovery. And, you know, you'll never see anybody more willing to work the Narcotics Anonymous program than the addict that comes crawling in that door after a long, hard run. He'll do anything, 90 meetings in 90 days, right? He wants to get a commitment. He's got, what, two, three sponsors? (laughs) So stay out of detox. He wants to take the coffee pot home. Fuck. That's how we lose half our literature. You won't be selling that in the hood. And 30, 60, 90 days later, that same addict's looking at me going, man, you mean we got to go to meetings every day? And just like the prize fighter that throws in the towel and says, I'm done, what do I do? I take that towel back one little piece at a time. I take my will back. And my experience shows me that the way for me to stay in a state of surrender is by coming to meetings regularly, by maintaining commitments, by being of service, by living in 10, 11, and 12, and by taking actions continuously that I don't believe in until eventually my thinking and my perception changes. And, you know, I couldn't, no one could give that to me. And I had to lose in every imaginable way before I could win with this thing. And you know, it's like unplugging a refrigerator. You know what happens if you unplug a refrigerator, right? Everything goes bad. It doesn't matter if it's 20 weeks old or 20 years old. My experience shows me, and if you unplug a refrigerator, everything looks fine for a while. And that's the trouble. I unplug from Narcotics Anonymous and put a little more into work, a little more into the relationship, and my life looks really good. But spiritually, I deteriorate. 
And my experience shows me that the shower I took yesterday won't keep me clean today. That I can't stay clean on yesterday's program. There's a lot of old timers that had a lot of years and they forgot how to have days. You know, my sponsor, it's, it's really strange because he told me, if you're not willing to take people through the steps, you're going to die. And that was the whole point of the exercise. The work in Narcotics Anonymous was not working on myself. It was getting rid of self so that I could be of service to others, so I could reach into my community and help other addicts. And through doing that, I would find freedom. And I didn't believe that until I experienced it. But we could talk all day long about what gets us into these rooms. I think it's more important as addicts in recovery to talk about what keeps us here. And you'll hear people's perception completely different. Oh, I ended up in NA. And you look at them and you can tell. I didn't end up in NA. I came here to start a brand new life. And why do I come back to help you? It took a long time for me to understand. See, there's two kinds of people in the real world. And I know I'm going to offend some people tonight, and I'm sorry. There's givers and there's takers. 90% of the world out there is takers, 10% are givers. Now, you come into Narcotics Anonymous, you think it's any different? Same thing, 90% takers, 10% givers. If you don't believe it, wait till they ask for cleanup tonight. <laughs> Start to wonder how many people actually registered for this thing. And we talk about the ties that bind us together. My friend said it was like a sporting event. You got fans and you got players. And the players are the ones that set up the meetings. They're the ones that put out the chairs. They're the ones that bring the literature. They're the ones that make the coffee. They're the ones that are on the committees. And then you get the fans. They're the ones that take the literature and take the coffee. And you know what? Narcotics Anonymous is the most dangerous spectator sport in the world. Fear won't keep me clean. If you're an addict, you know, and you're new and you're a little scared, that's cool. But my experience shows me that getting a third strike, living on the street, being homeless, losing my career, throwing away my education, losing my health, losing my family, losing my kids, that's not enough to keep me clean. Did scared straight work for you? Now, we have what they call the recreational user. There is such a thing. You know, they stop Sunday afternoon. But see, there's a big difference between, they're the ones that break the pipes and stuff. Now, you get a recreational user and a real addict in a holding tank for, say, driving under the influence, you get two completely different philosophies going on. You got the recreational user on one side of the cell thinking, man, what did I use so much last night? I knew I shouldn't have used so much. Real addicts on the other side of the cell thinking, why did I take this strip? Now, the court card people never laugh at that shit. They don't think that's funny at all. Should have been a completely different Friday night for you. Recreational user's wife says, you know, if you don't get clean, I'm leaving you. Recreational user cleans up his act. Doesn't use in the house, right? Gets a little visine. Now, if my woman says to me, honey, if you don't get clean, I'm leaving you. You know what I'm thinking, right? Thinking about single life. And as an addict in recovery, if you remember the way that I lived, like a lot of us lived, if anything got in the way of narcotics, it was out of my life. Anything got in the way of the bad. And I slowly compromised everything. I took jobs that would support my using. I picked women that would support my using. And slowly, it took it all. But if anything got in the way of using, it was out of my life. And if you're an addict in recovery, if anything gets in the way of Narcotics Anonymous, it's out of my life. Now, that may not be your experience, but that's my experience. And I remember the, you know, if a woman gets in the way of my recovery, you know, I remember the first time I said that from the, the podium, there she was in the back of the room. <laughs> She's like, baby, you don't look like an addict. Why you got to go to all those meetings? You're not speaking again, are you? 
You probably have given away of our recovery, our relationship. 30, 60 days later, I'm having Thanksgiving dinner with her and her lovely family. Head of the table, I'm all dressed up. Out comes the exotic wine. She's like, sweetie, you could have a glass of wine. It's just a glass of wine. Four more rehabs. She and I started her purse that night. She came to detox with a get well card. You know I did it to her again, right? Like what, four or five more times? Might have a couple girls like that in here tonight. That's what they call codependency, right? You guys know what the difference between a codependent and a toilet seat is? Toilet seat don't follow you around after you shit all over it. Well, was that a revelation or something? I might get killed after the meeting. There's a program for you guys. For her, a slip was 10 minutes of compassion. I have sponsees that pay more in taxes than I make all year. They have these huge careers and these little tiny programs. You know what? I've never seen one of them stand the test of time here. What do I do for a living? I stay clean. What do I, you know, what do I do for money? It's over there. And if I get them mixed up, I'm in handcuffs. If I get her mixed up, I'm in an emergency room. Or I get both. I'm handcuffed to a dirty. With a cop trying to get the rock out of my mouth, right? Oh, that might be a yet for you. Shit can happen. So I gotta take a look at that. Self-knowledge won't fix me. I've had every relapse prevention class known to man. We go through treatment 28 times, you've heard it all. You know, and if you're new and you think you're going to learn about your triggers and you're going to learn about relapse prevention, I mean, you may. I mean, I remember being in relapse prevention class and I'm raising my hand. We're talking about triggers. I tell my counselor, waking up's a trigger for me. I was asked to leave the class. I'm disturbing the other clients. Up. I want to use, right? So, you know, there I am behind a dumpster on Skid Row, drooling on myself with an outfit hanging out of my arm, reciting how it works out of the basic text. <laughs> and the bum next to me is like, will you shut up, man? You're ruining my high. <laughs> and I'm crying because I can't get back here because I've got a head full of Narcotics Anonymous, I got a bag full of dope, and I'm separate, different, and alone one more time. Oh, you think that sounds painful? You know what's worse? Being in this room tonight, really being an addict, and not working the 12 steps, that's worse. Coming to meetings late, leaving early, not having commitments, not being of service, not having a sponsor, that's worse. That's why I always want to, you know, welcome or inspire the guy in his last 30 days. You know, we don't talk to the guy in his last 30 days. We say, you know, welcome if you're in your first 30 days. We ought to say, you know, if you're in your last 30 days. Because, I mean, you can only spot the guy in his last 30 days. Just ask him how he's doing. I'm fine. I'm like, why don't you tell your face that, bro? Hey. But the tragedy of that is later we hear, oh, you know, so-and-so, he blew his brains out. He died. And it ain't so funny, you know, when it's someone you love. You know, one of our dearest friends, you know, that used to take me to meetings and hang out with me, you know, uh, killed himself. And it's like, he came and heard me speak 10 times. It didn't help him. Because knowledge won't fix me. I told my sponsor, I had a degree when I got clean. And you know what he said to me? He said, you know what? Thermometers have degrees. You know what he stick those? See, these 12 steps for me today are a set of principles. Only through application and practice will they relieve me of this obsession. There's people that know more about the 12 steps and about the literature and about the readings than I'll ever know on Skid Row. I'm trying to get another hit right now. And the difference between them and me is I got smart feet. 
and I'm not going to unplug that refrigerator. And I'm going to do today what I did yesterday, and I'm going to do tomorrow what I did today. You know, and because of that, you know, I've got some freedom. See, the knowledge is necessary for me to win the confidence of a newcomer. Where the clergy couldn't do it, where the therapist couldn't do it, where the drug and alcohol counselor couldn't do it, where the parole officer couldn't do it, another addict was able to win my confidence because he lived like me. Not just in the spoon, in the brillo, in the horn, but he lived like, like me in untreated addiction. And he could share that separation, that resentment, that selfishness, the dishonesty that addicts live with. He was able to share with me his experience, his strength, and his hope. And see, it's a thousand words. It means more than a thousand words. Like, you know, I see guys in my neighborhood and, you know, they're all strung out and they see me coming along and the first thing they say to me is, man, would you get out? You know, because you know, the only time we ever look like this is like, you know, a week after we get out. And I'm like, I've been out for years. And then we talk about how that happens. And then you hear it, well, you know, my life really ain't that bad. You know. There's two kinds of denial for me. One is denial about the problem, but the greater aspect of denial is about the solution. And we hear it. Most of us don't have to think twice about whether or not we're addicts. We're all nodding at that. But will the steps work for me like they work for you? A lot of people walk around saying Narconics Anonymous doesn't work. And I go, how many people were you sponsoring when you relapsed? Never heard it. Let's say we're doing one in 13. And you hear it, you know, there's a clue. The clue is this. You know they say keep coming back, it works if you work it? You ever heard them say keep coming back, it works if you know it? Another one I love is, oh, just think it through. Just play the tape through. I play the tape through back to Skid Row. And you know what my head tells me? Skid Row wasn't that bad. <laughs> Give me a toothless honey and a cardboard box, I can make it on Skid Row. I got an ATM card. They got dollar hits now. Don't laugh at that. And you know, part of the theme in this convention is about insanity. And I always thought insanity was doing the same thing and expecting different results. Isn't that what you hear around here? That's not the insanity I deal with. As an addict, my insanity is doing the same thing knowing exactly what's going to happen and doing it anyway. Now, at least the other kind of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting different results, at least there was some hope there. Now, I don't want to, if I haven't offended you already, but, you know, for me to pick up a bag of dubs, kind of like, say, having sex with a gorilla. Now, if you have sex with a gorilla, honey, it ain't over till a gorilla says it's over. You get that gorilla back in the cage, it starts looking at you again with those loving eyes. Remember how I used to be? I promise I won't hurt you this time. Nobody's gonna know. It's just a tip, baby, come on. That's the insanity that I live with. It reminds me of the polar bear. We were talking about this guy gets a rifle for his birthday. And one of his lifelong ambitions was to shoot a polar bear. So he goes to Alaska where the polar bears are and, you know, he sees this bear and he's got this new rifle. So he takes his shot and he kills a bear and he goes over to check out his kill, tap on his shoulder, bigger polar bear looking down there. The polar bear says, you know, you just shot my son. You got two choices. Either let me have my way with you or I'm going to maul you to death. A couple of weeks later, he's healing up in the hospital. Now he's got a resentment, right? He's going to go back and get this bear. So he heals up, gets back on the plane, goes up to the tundra where the bears are. He sees the bear. He takes his shot. He goes over to check out the bear. Tap on his shoulder. Bigger polar bear looking down at him. You just shot my uncle. You got two choices. Either let me have my way with you or I'm going to maul you to death. A couple weeks later, he's back in the hospital, 
healing up again, you know. Now this goes on and on, back and forth, back and forth. A couple years later, he's up there, you know, see the biggest polar bear he's ever seen, and it's the one. So he takes his shot, he goes over to check out his kill, tap on his shoulder, king of the polar bears looking down at him. And the king of the polar bear says, you know, we've been watching you. You're not really up here for the hunting, are you? Now that's a little message about the insanity of addiction. Because I can remember being 120 pounds, you know, dying of this disease, covered in tracks, and I'm looking, you know, five or six of my friends got me in the mirror, and I'm saying, I look great. And I'm killing myself. See, I'm driven by resentment. I'm driven by delusion. I'm driven by that selfishness. I'm driven by that fear. And it drives me back to an obsession. An obsession that drives me into this allergy and the allergy kills me. And I'm doomed to live that life over and over again. Now, you see a lot of people that, that come into Narcotics Anonymous. There's a lot of guys that I used with. You know, we did robberies together. We did all these despicable, diabolical things. And the weird thing is, as soon as they get clean, everything works for them. They put the bag of dope down, you know, and they fit in again. The career welcomes them back. They come to meetings once a year, never work a step, and their life gets consistently better. They've been serene since their ass hit the seat in Narcotics Anonymous. That's not my experience. My experience every time I put the bag down, the first thing they say to me is, boy, you need to be on medication. Why are you so angry? Why are you so emotional? What's wrong with you? Why can't you sit still back there? And I'm crying at dog food commercials. See, when I'm not using, I have a whole other set of problems. When I'm not using, I'm a prey to misery and depression. When I'm not using, I can't control my emotional nature. When I'm not using, I can't manage my personal relationships. When I'm not using, I'm full of fear. When I'm not using, I'm of no use to other people. In untreated addiction, I'm basically unhappy. And the way that plays out for me is I don't fit in, I'm not part of, you don't understand me, everybody's in my way, life's not treating me right, they're not paying me enough, I'm underappreciated, no one understands me, my woman's cheating on me, I gotta get loaded. And something magic happens, I pick up a bag of dope, and I intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. <laughs> Shit. Right? Give me a couple of drinks, fear of people in economic insecurity, leave me. I'm buying a half more drinks. <laughs> Hell, I'll write you a check. <laughs> Give me a couple of Viking and I can comprehend the word serenity and I know peace. <laughs> Give me a little cocaine, I want to start a business with you. <laughs> See, narcotics produces the illusion that my life is manageable. It sets up an illusion that my life is manageable. And unless I can find that freedom, that balance, that peace, that focus, that sense of unity that I found in narcotics through the 12 steps, there's no way I'm going to stay here. See, for me as an addict, narcotics was an artificial means to a spiritual experience. These 12 simple steps are a practical means to a spiritual experience. You take the bag away from me, you don't give me something better, I'm a dead man. And it took a long time for me to really understand that. That I would slowly spin out of control. Because it was narcotics that gave me the courage to ask that beautiful girl to dance, to walk across that dance floor. It was narcotics that gave me the guts to go after that big job, wings to fly. And unless I can find that freedom through this process, there's no way I'm gonna stay here. And when I'm not using, I'm chasing you four exits past my exit on the freeway. I'm jumping up and down on your hood in traffic. I'm counting your items in the checkout line. You get to the it. There was a guy that said the real problem here is in narcotics. He said the real problem is a conscious separation from God. 
And then he pointed to the 11th step where you see the solution, conscious contact with God. And the bridge for me to 2 to 11 was steps 4 through 9. And it took a long time for me to understand what a conscious separation from God was. I'll tell you one thing, I didn't want to pray. You know why? I didn't want God to find out where I was. And I found out through the agnostic aspect of this disease is that, see, I believed there was a God, but I lived like there wasn't one. And eventually, I was able to see that I believed in a Santa Claus God, that if I was good, I was going to get a reward. Or if you get in a closet and pray for a hot dog, you know what? You'll die. God can move mountains, but you better bring a shovel. I tell my sponsees, don't pray for women. God's not a pimp. But see, eventually I came to terms with an evolutionary process that this was a group of addicts. It became good orderly direction. And at the other end of the steps, it came the powerful hand of a loving God for me, like a lot of us. And I can't give you that if you're new. It was a process of uncovering and discovering the things that were blocking me. There's a poem in Notre Dame and it says, I saw my God, my God I could not see. I saw my soul, my soul I could not free. I saw my brother and I found all three. That's why we talk about the therapeutic value of one addict working with another is without parallel. They asked Michelangelo, how did you make the statue of David? And Michelangelo said, I never made the statue of David. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David and there he was. And that's the process of four through nine. You tell a little kid, go in your room and straighten out your room. He doesn't want to do that. You tell that same little kid, I want you to go in your room and throw out all your old stuff and we'll buy you new stuff. How long would that take? If you're stuck in inventory and you haven't done this process, why rob yourself? Those old ideas for me had to be broken. You know, coming to believe and taking actions and being rid of those things in me that were blocking me. Because I lived with resentment all my life. Resentment in Latin means to refeel. I take an event from my past, I refeel it, I relive it, and I reenact it in every aspect of my life. My life is like Groundhog Day. The problem with resentment is what we do with it as addicts. As an addict, I take poison and I hope you die. See, a normal person is intellect over emotion. As an addict, I'm emotion over intellect. And unless I can have an entire psychic change in that area, I cannot be free. My sponsor said, what do you want from Narcotics Anonymous? And I said, you know, I grew up in Malibu. I want a yacht and a Learjet. And you know what he said to me? He said, if you work steps four through nine and you consistently live in 10, 11, and 12, what you'll get is a quiet mind and a loving heart. And I looked at him and I said, what do I want that for? You know, but if you've been separated from narcotics for a while, you guys know what the opposite of a quiet mind is. It's a mind that won't shut up. It's a mind that's up at 3 in the morning telling you you're a loser. You're fat. You know that job you got? They're going to do the background check on you. You know? The opposite of a loving heart is a vindictive heart. It's a prejudiced heart. It's a resentful heart. And all of my life, I was crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. And yesterday I have guilt, shame, and remorse. And tomorrow I have fear, anxiety, and worry. And our spirits are very much like a body of water. When they're perfectly still, they best reflect the heavens. Now I know how to get there with a bag of dough. But it's less I can find that sense of freedom and ease that I found in narcotics through this process. I won't stay here. In closing, if someone did to me what I did to myself, I would have killed them. If someone did to me what I did to others, I would have killed them. And when I came to these rooms, you think I wanted to pray? I thought God had been watching. Those three simple relationships with God, with self, and with others had been destroyed. I was bankrupt in those areas. If you really look at the 12 steps by design, steps one through three, recreate and develop a relationship with God. Steps four through seven, recreate and develop a relationship with self. Steps eight and nine, recreate and develop a relationship with others. 10 maintains my relationship with self. 11 maintains my relationship with God. And 12 maintains my relationship with others. So coming out of the steps, 
for the first time, I'm able to live in harmony in those basic, simple relationships. There was a great spiritual teacher. He was asked, what's the most important thing of all your teachings? He said, love God with all thy heart, love thy neighbor as thyself. And if God scares you out of these rooms and you're a real addict, don't worry about it. Don't man will scare you back in. You know, I've been told I got to hurry up, so let me, let me close with this. It's probably one of the oldest uh, stories in Narcotics Anonymous. It's about a five-year-old kid, and this little kid, he wants to play with his dad, and he's trying to figure out a way to, you know, get his dad's attention. The dad's like a, an accountant, so he's trying to figure out a way to get rid of this little boy, so he gets a map of the world. You know National Geographic, they have those great maps of the world? And he rips this map of the world up into like 50 pieces, and he gives it to the little boy, and he says... Here's some tape, son. What I want you to do is I want you to put this little map of the world back together and then we'll play. And he's thinking, it's going to take the kid an hour. I finally got rid of him. Little boy comes back in two minutes. He's got the whole map of the world all taped back together. And the dad says, son, that's impossible. It's impossible. How did you do that? And the little boy says, dad, on the back of the map of the world was a picture of a man. I just put the man back together and the whole world fell into place. And that is the spiritual technology of Narcotics Anonymous for me. That it rebuilds the man. One through three with God, four through seven with self through inventory, eight and nine with others through service and through amends, and then maintains those simple relationships. And like a lot of us, for me, the whole world fell into place. So if I live to be 100 years old, I could never pay Narcotics Anonymous back for the freedom and the relationships and the friendships and the love and the awesome higher power, you know, and all the gifts that we've got here. And, you know, people say, I have a grateful addict. I used to want to throw up when I heard that. But, you know, looking back at it, the disease of addiction is the only disease when treated that leaves the sufferer in a better position than if they didn't have the disease. And the only way to really know that is to have the psychic change and live these 12 steps. Thanks for having me.